So good afternoon, it's so nice to be here. It's really nice to be here. I've never been to Lithuania before. I'm so happy to be here. I've always wanted to go. I've always been so interested. Um, I've known Lithuanian people my whole life, and so it's wonderful to actually see you in your native habitat. It's wonderful. <laughs> so physicists, chemists, material scientists, bioengineers, Ah, the few, the proud. Uh, chemical engineers, civil engineers. Just okay. Just wondering where undergraduate. Oh, good for you, graduate. Everybody else? Okay, postgraduate. Very good. I just wanted to know who I'm talking to. So thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. And this is, a, this is actually the oldest building at Rice University. And uh, we're in Houston, Texas, which is the third, uh, fourth largest city in the United States. And I think my battery just died, but so we'll just have to figure out how we can, how we can do this without a, without a laser. Laser free talk. So, so um, everyone that talks about nano, we know about nano, we know about this, right? This is nanoelectronics or electronics. This is the 20th century, going from solid state transistor to, uh, to, to, oh, I need a, yeah, I need something. Yeah, that's mine and that died. Yeah, this is mine. So let me put mine back and let me try your driver and we'll see if that works. Okay, it's an intelligence test for my computer. Okay. Let's put that on. Okay, so let's see if that, it's going to have to, okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is sort of done story, right? You can't miniaturize uh, uh, electronics any further, so people are excited about quantum computing because you can't miniaturize electronics any further. <clears throat> But if we think about light, we can actually ask the question, how can we take photons, how can we take light that is of very, very large dimensions, right? Telescopes and so on, how can we, how can we take, uh, how, how, can we, how can we miniaturize optics to the nanoscale? And one way to do that is with, um, is going beyond uh, the integrated optics of the latter 20th century, which brought us off optical fiber, telecommunications and so on. <clears throat> to the nanoscale, uh, we're using metals. And so this interesting little structure here is two silver spheres, about 100 nanometers in diameter, and they're separated by about a four nanometer gap. <clears throat> and if I shine light on this structure, polarized along the inner particle axis, I can concentrate light in this very, very small gap into dimensions that are, that are uh, less than a hundredth of a wavelength of light. And so this is actually uh, 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 one, one of the most exciting potentials of metal nanoparticles and light and why we're excited about the combination of light and metal particles. And that is such a, this is such a paradigm that this ha actually has a little nickname called a hotspot. And so that is actually a, a wonderful example of how one can actually use uh, can, can use non-dielectrics and their and and their 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 unusual dielectric function to focus light far far below the the diffraction limit. So metal particles are wonderful. Michael Faraday used to give lectures about about gold nanoparticles. Gold nanoparticles don't look gold. Gold nanoparticles instead have a very different property. <coughs> they, 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 they absorb green light, and so they transmit the complementary color. So we see red light. <coughs> and uh, this, is, uh, the, this phenomenon was actually was, was, was known phenomenologically before there were chemists back when there were, were alchemists. This is a beautiful cup found in the British Museum and often found in high school chemistry books. Uh, <clears throat> that illustrates the real beautiful optical properties of uh, gold nanoparticles. And the, um, this was actually the first triumph of classical electromagnetic theory by Gustav Mead to actually describe why a, a, a sub-wavelength particle of gold with an incident plane wave and with the best measurement of the dielectric function they could possibly do back in 19, 1908, why this particle actually absorbs uh, green light and looks red and does not look uh, the macroscopic color. <coughs> so uh, we got, we're very interested in this idea and we uh, decided to do a s very simple uh, uh, variation of this and not with, start with a solid particle but with a hollow particle or at least electromagnetically a ho hollow particle, <coughs> have a, a, something with a dielectric, oh my goodness, my mother-in-law's online. <laughs> not a good idea, okay. <coughs> 
So, but I love her. Okay, so. Uh, so uh, particles that, that where, where now we have a tuning knob, we can control the relative size of the core and the shell. And <clears throat> we weren't the first people to think of this, th think of this structure at all. M decades ago, people studied this nice symmet spherically symmetric structure uh, theoretically and predicted that if you vary the relative size of the core and the shell, you can tune the plasmon to whatever wavelength you want. And so uh, we set, a, set, set, set our sights on making this structure structure and that became uh, a wonderful focus of our work for, uh, for a great many years. Both the fundamental science of how this, this works, which I'll explain to you in a moment, and also some of its applications. So people are very interested in plasmon resonances. So when I say plasmon resonance, what am I talking about? I'm talking about <clears throat> the collective electronic oscillation of delocalized electrons in a metal. Um, that can these days that can extend to any material like doped semiconductors, even molecules with delocalized uh, electrons in their orbitals in a partially filled orbital can have a plasmon, believe it or not. But let's today we're just going to talk about metals. <clears throat> so if I have a little sphere of gold, then uh, the electrons will slosh back and forth. I can think of it as a simple harmonic oscillator, a simple classical harm harmonic oscillator. And this will absorb at a well-known res resonant frequency. If I stretch the particle and it's no longer a sphere, but it's a rod, <coughs> then what would I have? I would have two resonant frequencies. I'd have electrons that oscillate along the longitudinal axis. They'd have a lower energy and electrons over here and electrons that oscillate on the transverse axis, and they'd have a higher energy. And that's what chemists can do. Right? So if you're not a chemist, you're a physicist, and you don't like all that chemistry stuff, you can go to the clean room, and you can make a little structure, like a little square, and you would find that you have a, a, a resonance very much what, similar to what you would have, what you would have made in, in, in a chemistry lab, downshifted, because now it's sitting on the substrate. <coughs> and if you then make a little different structure that looks kind of like a rod, you would find, in fact, you have the same uh, properties, again, shifted, shifted by, by substrate and broadened by the fact that it's multicrystalline. <coughs> so this is actually one of the reasons why plasmonics is a field that has really taken off across multiple disciplines, because the same physics is there, you, de, it, it, independent of the different approaches that you might have for fabricating uh, structures. But you can see that there's a, 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 the, the similarity is there and is robust and has attracted many people into this field. So what happens if we bring particles together? So I have two particles, two, two gold spheres, and I bring them together. <coughs> So I can think of that, as I just said, just describe one structure as, as, as being like an oscillator. <clears throat> if I bring two together, I can have a classical picture where I can think of them as basically two coupled oscillators. And the quantum analog of that <clears throat> is, if I, is, is, is if I think of these as wave functions. So if, say, I have a, in, instead of having a gold sphere, I have a hydrogen atom, okay, one s orbital. So, 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 so a hydrogen atom with its, it, it, its um, uh, 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 states, <clears throat> atomic states, if I bring another hydrogen atom next to it, well, what happens? Well, the two wave functions will mix and hybridize and form instead molecular orbitals, which will have a completely different set of, uh, set, set, set of modes, set of energy levels. <clears throat> and so we can think of this picture um, as being uh, uh, directly analogous to what happens when we have uh, plasmon. So if I have two, one gold sphere and another gold sphere, and they have a well-defined energy. I showed you that plasmon resonant energy already absorbs green light. If I bring the two together, then I form a coupled system where I have uh, basically a whole new set of states. And it looks a lot like a diatomic molecule. There's actually a rigorous analogy between the qu a simple quantum system and what, uh, and, and what this uh, spheres with maybe 10,000 delocalized electrons uh, uh, are doing. <clears throat> and so, so we call this plasmon hybridization because it looks just like wave function hybridization. And it is actually the classical analog of wave function hybridization. But it is, but, but it, but, but it is rigorous down to the quantum level. If you solved the Schrodinger equation for 10,000 electrons, you would actually get this, uh, it, you, you would get, get this same exact result. <clears throat> and so because this is so similar to molecular orbitals, I can call these two new states a bonding plasmon and an anti-bonding plasmon. And so I drew these little arrows to show you how the oscillations are actually happening. So we can then invoke the simple classical picture of two coupled pendulums, right? They're going to couple in phase or they're going to couple out of phase. <clears throat> and uh, th those are the two solutions to that. 
um, to that particular structure. So they look like they look like a diatomic molecule. We call them dimers or artificial uh, uh, diatomic molecules, <coughs> and uh, they have a wonderful property that you can see very easily if you go into the lab. If you just take a solution of of gold nanoparticles, it looks red to the eye. And that would be these individual particles here. You bring them together, you're going to see a very different states. You've redshifted this, in the, so th this mode in energy. This mode does not absorb light. These are out of phase oscillations. It doesn't couple to the, electro to the electromagnetic field. This one does. Okay? And it absorbs red light, so it looks a complementary color. It looks blue to the eye. So you have basically a very dramatic red-blue color change when the gold nanoparticles come together. <clears throat> and this is the fundamental uh, mechanism behind the world's first plasmonic device. Now this is a device that many of you have used. You can go to a pharmacy and you can buy this device. So I'm going to ask you, what could this device be? Some of you are probably smiling already. Some of you know this already. Very good. <clears throat> so it's a fluidic device, and I'm going to measure some molecules in a fluid, and so these molecules that I want to detect are flowing down the fluid. They reach this first region, which is pink, because I have gold nanoparticles with little antibodies that are going to, uh, uh, that are going to recognize this analyte, and they're going to flow again down the channel, having captured this analyte, until they get to the second channel, where there's a bunch more of antibodies, and so, uh, of gold nanoparticles with their antibodies attached. And and they're going to find them, and they're going to form little dimers. And as we just learned, the dimers are not, are, are, are not red to the eye. They are, in fact, blue to the eye. So what is this? Some of you are smiling. It's a home pregnancy test. So <coughs> um, very likely you'll use one of these, uh, or one of your friends will use one of these at some time in their life. And so this is, this is why, so, so the sensitive ones are blue because they're not based on molecules, they're based on gold nanoparticles which have a much larger absorption cross-section. So they allow you to detect this change much earlier. So the very early pregnancy tests are all based on gold nanoparticles. So, so uh, what can we do with this idea of plasmon hybridization? Well, we can use this to design a whole bunch of new and interesting nanoparticles <coughs> of different shapes. And the shapes we, can, we, we make, not randomly, we make based on our understanding now of how plasmons mix and hybridize. And so <coughs> I'll just show you a, 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 an assortment of them. And because there's no, no nomenclature for nanoparticles, we get to name them whatever we want. And so we can name them very funny names. And so since I work at Rice University, it would make sense that I would make a nanoparticle based on my, the name of my employer. You remember one of the great things, great accomplishments in, in, in nanoscience is when, is when Don Eigler wrote IBM in helium atoms, right? So there's a tradition of naming something after your employer. <coughs> so, they, so we have nano rice. We can also make structures that look like little uh, semi, se, se, semi spheres, we'll call them nano cups. You're, you, people in Lithuania, you know Russian, right? So I, I don't even have to tell you what that is. Okay, that's a nano. That's a nano shell around another nanoparticle. <coughs> so, uh, and you can't, but you can't buy those in the airport. <coughs> you can also extend this to coupling of nanowires to each other, or nanoparticles to nanowires. You can make structures that look remarkably like uh, like heteronuclear diatomic molecules. <coughs> you can also make structures that look like that out, out of materials other than metals. So graphene supports plasmons. And of course, voltage tunable plasmons, you can dump more electrons in with a bias voltage and you can tune graphene plasmons all throughout the infrared. Uh, we can make structures that look like more com complex molecules and all have their very, uh, uh, ver very well established set of, uh, set of modes. Nanoshells, as I mentioned, and then more recently we've started to think about how we can, how we can leave the world of gold and silver and move into some more sustainable materials like, like aluminum. And so these are actually some so, some aluminum nanoparticles that we made uh, uh, very recently. <coughs> so I mentioned nanoshells before, so nan we can use this picture of plasmon hybridization, this paradigm, this concept, to describe why these are tunable particles. And so if we think about this structure, we can, uh, we can, we can conceptually deconstruct it as basically a, sh a sphere and a cavity. And so if we take the sphere and the cavity as our primitive modes and we mix them together, we have something like a shell. And 
<coughs> we would then have two hybridized plasmon modes. One of them uh, will, have a, will couple very strongly to uh, ele electromagnetic wave, one very weakly to the electromagnetic wave. And so it's this, this uh, fe the lower energy feature, I'm sorry, the lower energy feature here that couples to, the, um, that couples to light and gives us a tunable absorption that goes from, uh, fr from the visible into the infrared as one makes the shell thinner and thinner and thinner, which makes most sense because uh, as the shell gets thinner, then the interaction between the surface, the sphere, and the cavity within our shell gets stronger and stronger. And that's what gives rise to this uh, particular effect. So <clears throat> I'll say more about nanoshells later. Uh, one of the things that they're real, so the question, so we make them, okay, what are they good for? Good question. <clears throat> so they have very nice resonances. It's very easy to put their resonance in the near infrared, we're around 800 nanometers, just to the red of what the eye can see for those of you who are not, who are not optical in nature. Um, and this is a very important region of the spectrum, at least for bioengineers, it's a very important region of the spectrum. This is a region where we are the most transparent. After all, we are big bags of water, right? So water is most, mostly transparent. Uh, in this region, that means we are as well. <coughs> and so uh, what we can do in this particular region, we can take our nanoparticles and make, make them very strongly absorbing right in this region where our tissue is the most transparent. So sort of like having a window, we, we can actually put a remote controlled particle, something we can control by near infrared light somewhere in the body and we can actually use uh, 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 you, you use that, you use the fact that light transmits through the, through the body, yet is absorbed by nanoparticles uh, to do some interesting things. And so to, for particular, to do, uh, to do cancer therapy. <clears throat> so this is an illustration of how that works. So you take nanoshells, as I've just described them, and you have to have a mouse with a tumor, and then you inject the, the nanoparticles, not into the tumor, but you inject them into the tail vein, and they circulate throughout the, the animal. And uh, uh, very gradually, so there's no, nothing special attached to the, nano, to the nanoparticles at all. You just have a, 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 a polyethylene glycol coating, a little coating that, 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 per, that, that restricts how much they stick to uh, capillary walls, for example. <clears throat> so they're not recognized by proteins. There's no immune response to the, to the nanoparticles. They're not recognized by the immune system. <clears throat> and over several hours, they will, they, they will take up naturally within a tumor site. Why does that happen? It happens because um, tumors grow their blood vessels, their, what's, their vasculature, very, very rapidly. You know, they metabolize faster than normal cells. And they grow their blood vessels to feed this rapid growth. But they grow it in a very chaotic manner. So there's sort of dead ends, there's, there, there, there's all this disorder where the blood vessels are formed. And so it's very easy for particles that are about 100 nanometers to get trapped within the tumor vasculature. And people have known about that for decades, actually. People use that for drug delivery into tumors, chemotherapy drugs, uh, since, since, since the 1970s. So it's a well-known effect. <coughs> it's called the enhanced permeability and retention effect. <coughs> and so if you, you wait 12 hours until the particles are taken taken up in the tumor, and then you just shine near infrared light through the skin into the tumor, and this is a mouse. This is a mouse on the day of treatment with a subcutaneous tumor, and this is the day of day 12 after the, the tumor is just irradiated for a few minutes, <clears throat> and you can see between day zero and day 12 that the tumor is, uh, is completely in remission. This is, a little, is just a little scab or you know, just a little damage to the surface, uh, to the skin surface that, that sloughs off after about day 14. <clears throat> So we did this actually quite some time ago, 2003. It's taken a long time to get through FDA approval. I can say some more about that later. <clears throat> but then uh, in, uh, oh, about five years ago, this entered the clinic. And this is something, you don't, if you, this makes you queasy, then don't look. <clears throat> this is a, was the first human patient who had a, a, a tremendously uh, a disfiguring tumor on his neck. And so this was actually here, it was treated, and this was actually the first successful treatment of a, of a, a human uh, 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 case of tumor remission. So the, we started a company, a company is called uh, Nanospectral Biosciences, and uh, as I'll mention earlier, it exists. So I don't want to show these pictures of people, but we can see pictures of dogs, right? Dogs are wonderful. There's a, a network of eight, of, of eight veterinary hospitals where they are treating uh, dogs, so this, 
The, this little gal, her name is Okui, and she's being treated at the University of Georgia in a Athens, Georgia, which has a big veterinary uh, uh, facility. And you can see this really nasty tumor on her leg. Dogs often get tumors on their appendages, uh, and they're really quite, uh, they're very, very difficult to treat, if not impossible to treat. When you see a dog with an ampu amputated leg, it's often because of a, of a tumor that uh, was on the appendage. <coughs> So this is how this this is how the the, the the this type of therapy is done actually in in practice, and I'll I'll, I'll explain why later in my talk. <coughs> so basically, rather than just shining light through the skin, they infuse the nanoparticles they take up in the tumor site, and then they come in with uh, with, with fiber optic probes, and they insert the probes all throughout the tumor volume uh, to make sure that all of the light is uh, the, uh, the, the, all the nanoparticles are exposed to light. And then uh, we can see actually within uh, this is uh, within a month you see this wonderful just complete tumor remission. So there's a lot of excitement about uh, about the about this sort of treatment, and I'll say more about that later. <coughs> so I um, when we first started working on this, uh, people were very interested and very excited about this. And then always someone in the back of the room would ask me this question: Can you know can this can this can nanoshells be used to, for for solar energy? And he's just scratch my head and say, well, maybe someday we'll, we'll figure out some way to do that. Um, and so we, started, uh, so we started thinking about that a few years ago. And so we started to do a very interesting experiment. So you know how to make steam, right? Everyone knows how to make steam. Right? How do you make steam? You make steam the way I used to make steam. You make steam, and I still make steam this way, right? I buy, take a, a, a volume V of water and I put heat underneath it and then I wait a long time, right? Because it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water and then you have the enthalpy of vaporization. <clears throat> but eventually I will make steam. But if I'm, not, if, I'm, if I'm too impatient, I can do it another way and I can take my volume of water <clears throat> and I can put in light absorbing nanoparticles. I can shine light on it. That could be a laser light. It could be sunlight. I'll show you examples of both. <clears throat> and I would make steam right away. And just to be fancy, I could make steam, oh, at very high efficiency. I could actually make it if I put the whole thing in an ice bath. So I'm going to show you that in a moment. <clears throat> So, this is, a, so, so th this is an interesting, very sophisticated experiment I'm going to show you if I have nanoparticles and I say I, I shine a, a laser at the wavelength that the nanoparticles absorb and I just put them on an analytical balance and I measure the mass loss, then I'm measuring basically how much steam is produced. And uh, if I have particles on resonance versus particles off resonance, I would, I would see this very simple mass loss. So we're going to use that very sophisticated method uh, later in my talk. So now I'm going to show you exactly what I ex described to you. And that is how you can make steam uh, while, while the, um, how you can make steam without boiling water. <coughs> so I'm going to show you a video, and, but to the video goes fast. So to explain the video, I have to show you what's go going on. So we have a test tube full of with, with water that is filled with nanoparticles, light absorbing nanoparticles. We have a little block of, of, of oil on the top just so we can see what's going on. <coughs> we stuck a thermocouple in the bottom so I can measure the temperature d increase. <coughs> I put the whole thing in an ice bath. And then I shine focused sunlight on the nanoparticles, and I'm going to see uh, steam generation. So let's see if this works. There we go. OK, this is the thermocouple here. This is a timer just for dramatic effect. <coughs> and so here's my little simple test tube. I focus sunlight. Very quickly, I see that I made steam. And I made steam in a very short period of time, and the thermocouple still reads 0. OK, so how does that work? OK, so, look, so, so we can do this experiment again. So we don't use solar simulators, just so you know. I live in Houston, Texas, and Houston is, has the same latitude as Cairo, Egypt. So I'm so much further south than you guys. Okay. So we, and we get a lot of sunlight. So, so the southwestern United States has a lot of sunlight, so we have so so we can easily do a lot of it out, outdoor experiments. So it's much easier than than having to get a solar simulator. You just go outside. <clears throat> so you can see our very sophisticated laboratory. We have our lab chairs out here and our lab our, our lab bench there. <clears throat> so what am I showing you here? I'm showing you a solution of nanoparticles in a in, in a in a in a test tube. There's a thermocouple in the bottom, and they are sitting on an analytical balance. Remember, I explained to you that experiment before. So now I can measure the t the temperature increase of the fluid, and I can measure the mass loss at the same time. So I can measure both how much energy is consumed by 
the, uh, by, by heating the liquid and how much energy it goes directly into uh, vaporization of the water. <clears throat> so I can do this with different types of nanoparticles. Uh, and and it, it, as long as they're broadband absorbers, it doesn't really matter which type of nanoparticle. So <clears throat> say I, I can uh, uh, illuminate, my, uh, illuminate my experiment, <clears throat> and I have two, diff two different volumes of the experiment. Obviously, the, the energy is going to be the heat capacity times delta T for, the, for the whatever mass of the water I'm using. <clears throat> so for uh, over a given four-minute window, for larger, a larger mass, I have a smaller temperature increase. For a smaller mass, I have a larger temperature increase. Right? And it's linear. It doesn't, those little glitches are because the sun moves. And so we have to move our big fancy Fresnel lens here. We have to move this in order to follow the, follow the line. So <clears throat> when I look at how much steam I, I generate, it's independent of the mass, completely independent of the mass. And then if I look at how much, how much energy is consumed by either process, what I find is <coughs> that uh, the energy that it takes to produce steam, so more than 80% of the energy goes directly into steam generation, and less than 20% goes into fluid heating. So what is in the world is going on? So <coughs> when we first did this, so we, when we first reported this, we thought what was going on was <coughs> that here we, we have our nanoparticles, and they absorb sunlight, and then they form some sort of a, 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 of a bubble around themselves. And then they rise to the surface, and this bubble the, the, through buoyancy is, is released. But the story is much, more is, is much more complicated than that. If we look more carefully, and we actually look at the, at the numbers, and we look at how much heat is absorbed. So let's think about this now, OK? <coughs> um, Let's think about this in terms of heat transfer. I have a gold nanoparticle, and it's sitting in water. That's a water bath. Okay? What's going to win? The water bath's going to win. Right? The temperature's not going to The surface of the nanoparticle would not be heating up without, I mean, basically, the, 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 this heat is going to be dissipated by the water bath. That's what water baths are good for. right? <clears throat> And so if I look at, the, look at the actual numbers for this experiment and I calculate what the temperature increase should be at my nanoparticle, I find a re absolutely ridiculously low number, okay, less than a tenth of a degree. So that's certainly not consistent with what I'm seeing. So what could be going on? <coughs> And we weren't the only people to see this. So this wonderful group at MIT, Gong Chen, who's sort of the, the, the guru of heat transfer, <coughs> was writing a paper with Svetlana Borskina and Hadi Gassemi um, about really looking at, nano, at, at, at bubble formation. When you shine a bright laser on a nanoparticle, you can make bubbles. That's very easily done. We've done some experiments with single nanoparticles to watch that bubble formation. And when we did it, we began to realize this is very interesting. We needed about 100 times more power than what we were actually delivering in our solar experiment. <clears throat> and, and so they wrote, they wrote this really wonderful article, and they wrote this, this interesting uh, 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 sentence here. The puzzle is that the theoretical estimate of the nanoparticle temperature rise in 25, OK, that's us, it is based on the calculation of absorbed power and the solution of the Fourier law heat conduction equation is only 0 0.04 degrees Celsius. So what could be going on? And it turns out what we're seeing is a very interesting collective effect, and it's something that is actually um, it, it's related to some very elegant physics, and it doesn't have anything to do with individual nanoparticles. One can make nano, uh, bubbles around a nanoparticle, but you do need, as I said, you need about two, more than two orders of magnitude more power to do so. <clears throat> and so what are we seeing? So let's think about this. So, this is a, this is, so what do we have in our solution? We have a solution of particles that do two things. These particles both scatter light and they absorb light. <clears throat> and so if I think of this as individual photons coming down, so this is basically a cuvette uh, of solution and a laser beam incident from the top, just like the sunlight, but here, here it was just, just monochromatic. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so what's going to happen to each individual photon? They will encounter a particle, and they may scatter, encounter another particle, scatter. And eventually, they'll get absorbed. Maybe not at the first particle, but eventually, they will get absorbed. And so this regime, where you have both scattering and absorption of light, it turns out is a regime where both physicists and chemists have avoided this regime. <clears throat> so there's a wonderful, uh, a, 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 a beautiful phenomenon called Anderson localization of light. And people study Anderson localization of light. It has some characteristic properties like coherent backscattering and so on. And just one of the things you must do if you're going to study Anderson localization of light, you must work with scattering particles that are 
not, that do not absorb light. If they absorb light, then, it, then, 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 then you cannot observe that, 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 that phenomenon very accurately. But we need to be work, absorption is what makes this whole phenomenon work. So now we're in a regime where we have to look at particles that both scatter and absorb light. <coughs> And so the only way to do this, we can't take any approximation, is to do Monte Carlo simulations of each photon coming down. And after we do several hundred thousand photons, we get a good idea of how they would scatter off of particles that, would be in, that, are, that are in solution. So what am I showing you now? I'm showing you the theoretical calculation of particles that have an absorption and a scattering cross-section that we know, because we control the particles, the pro those properties, very accurately in this experiment. And I increase the concentration of those nanoparticles. They're actually nanoparticles shell so I can control all, all those properties. I increase the concentration, this is particles per ml, by, 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 by an order of magnitude and another order of magnitude. And I look then, I detect in my simulation the light that scatters out the front of the face as if I were going to go into the lab and take a picture of the light scattering out. And so I, I, so I see an interesting effect. I see that basically the, the, the light is concentrated close to the li liquid vapor interface. And I even see this coherent backscattering, which is, in fact, a signature of Anderson localization of light. So <clears throat> we take this simulation. Okay, the simulation was done before any experiments, and we said, well, the, with this experiment, with, with, with the simulation, I should be able to do exactly this, ex exactly this experiment, take a photograph, and see something that looks remarkably like this, uh, uh, like the simulations. And in fact, we did. So this is the same type of concentration, same scattering, cross sections and absorption cross sections for the particles, and we see, in fact, uh, ex precisely what's going on. So now we can take that same calculation and look to where the energy goes. So where does the energy go? <clears throat> this is the same calculation, but rather than looking at the photons that scatter out towards the camera, I'm looking at where the photons actually get absorbed. And as I go up in concentration, I find that I can actually, uh, I'm, basically, this is a light trapping effect. <clears throat> this is a, a light trapping effect where we have multiple scattering, but in the presence of absorption, all the energy gets coupled very, very close to the, the, the liquid vapor interface, which is where we want to heat the water if we want to make steam and not heat the volume. Of course, we want to heat it there. We don't want to heat it down there. We've been doing it the wrong way, right, for thousands of years. <clears throat> so uh, and this is just a histogram of how many scattering events before absorption. <clears throat> and so then when we take this as our heat source and do the heat, sol solve the heat transfer e equation with that as our heat source, we in fact can reproduce really beautifully exactly the ice bath experiment. So we can actually see, you know, at the, we, so we can take a, a cuvette and with an infrared thermocouple we measure the temperature at the top, we measure the temperature at the bottom, and of course at the top we see the temperature go up. Uh, at, with laser irradiation, and at the bottom, there's no light getting there because all the light's being trapped right at that interface, and it's enough. It's it's it, it concentrated enough that it's generating steam, and uh, and, and and we see this very nice uh, agreement between uh, simulation and experiment with really no adjustable parameters at all. So what does this have to do with cancer therapy? <clears throat> well, cancer therapy, we're talking about, I mean, there's many, many cases in the world that are absorbed in the real world, not the physics lab, the real world, that, um, that involve both scattering and absorption of light. And tissue is highly scattering. <clears throat> so here we're taking nanoparticles, with we, which we already know, both absorb and scatter light. <clears throat> and uh, if we think about what actually would be happening within a tumor volume, that exact same optical property is going to happen within a tumor volume. And so if I, um, so this, this, if, I, if, if I look at this as a calculation and I make my, my sphere, right? So the physicists always joke about spherical chickens. Do they joke about that, spherical chickens in Lithuania? Yeah, yeah of course. It's a universal mark of physicists. <clears throat> So, um, so, so here's my, my spherical, spherical tumor, <clears throat> and if I look at this, if I look at the, the, the tumor and, uh, and I change the nanoparticle concentration, I find what bioengineers like to call a Goldilocks problem. They have too, uh, too, few too few scatterers here, the light passes through, they have no heating, they have too many scatterers here, and they have coherent backscattering, and then for this concentration they have a region where they can actually have significant heating. So then how does one avoid this? Remember I showed you, um, when we actually, when, when, when one actually treats a tumor, they go in with many fiber optic probes and they actually probe direct light right into the tumor. So if you're not trying to shine light from above, but you're actually uh, shining light from fiber optics that go 
it, uh, uh, that, are, that are distributed around the tumor and actually penetrate the tumor, then you actually can solve the optical, uh, the, the, the optical scattering problem that is characteristic of this. <clears throat> so, so the final story about, uh, uh, about cancer therapy is, has to do with prostate cancer. So it turns out that, um, it, 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 it turns out that uh, <clears throat> this is a huge problem. Right? There's a huge patient population. Um, these are numbers that are probably very scary to you. They're scary to me. My father was a cancer, was a prostate cancer survivor, and the CEO of this company is also a prostate cancer survivor. <clears throat> and uh, 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 prostate cancer is usually treated if somebody has a, the, the uh, genetic predisposition for this or the history uh, within their own uh, health, health history for prostate cancer. Um, then this is usually monitored by active surveillance, which means that they just m check for it every six months to see if the PSA uh, level is increased. <clears throat> and um, so the typical way this is treated is with radiation as the first step, uh, and radiation and surgery, and then if things are really uh, 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 have, have, have moved outside to, to latter stage, um, then uh, chemotherapy is a last resort. <clears throat> And so what the, um, what the prostate uh, uh, oncologists now are beginning to realize is that <clears throat> rather than using radiation as the first step of treatment, can we use nanoshell-based therapy, which they call, that's the commercial name, oralase therapy, as the first line of defense before one gets to radiation treatment. And so there's, uh, there, there's a, a human study with four different sites, two in New York City, one in Houston, and one at the University of Michigan Medical Center that, are, that, that have been uh, taking patients since January and, uh, and, and they see that this is very, very promising. And just to show you what the, this is some, just some, some information from the company. So with focal therapy, that's oral ACE therapy, uh, the type of treatment, the, the sort of the complications after treatment are really, really minor. There are no permanent side effects, but permanent side effects happen for the majority of patients under, uh, under, under uh, uh, conventional uh, radical treatments. So, that, so, so we're extremely excited about the possibility. Okay. Let me switch gears for a minute. So we've been talking about scatter, scattering particles and absorbing particles in the context of heating. Let's ignore the heating for a minute. Because this is a very interesting optical effect. OK, let's just talk about light scattering and imaging. So if I have fog, OK, and I'm trying to look through the fog, OK, what happens to the photons? They go from, my, from the object to, to the image or from the, from, from, from the, the scene, right, this lovely little bucolic scene to my eye, <laughs> and they will encounter scatterers, right? And there will be some, pho some photons that pass directly through this medium of scatterers, and those are the ballistic photons, right? And so the ballistic photons will actually help me, help me get an image, right? Um, but the scattered photons won't, right? They'll de detract from the image. <laughs> uh, but what happens if I add absorbers to my scatterers. So <clears throat> the probability that a photon gets absorbed is going, to be, is, is going to be proportional to its optical path length. So <clears throat> the ballistic photons are less likely to be absorbed than the ones that scatter light because they have a longer path length. Okay. So do you believe that? It actually, it actually works. I mean, it makes sense. That makes sense. So, this, so, so let me show you. It actually works. <clears throat> so here we did, the, we, we did an experiment where, so we're, we're, we're trying to resolve, an I, resolve images here. We take three different types of scatterers. So these are just polystyrene spheres, they're scatterers. <clears throat> and, they, um, and then we add abs an, absor an absorber. Here we, we add a dye. No, we are actually, we're adding carbon black to this, not a dye. And <clears throat> so you can actually see if you resolve this, the spatial frequency that shows us what our actual image resolution is going to be. So for water, it's very high, okay? And for this is clear up here, and for a scatterer without absorption, it's very very low. But as I begin to increase um, my absorption, I begin to increase my ability to resolve the image. And it, very interestingly, it depends on the type of scatterer. If my scatterer is really small, then this is a big effect. If my scatterer is really big, then it's actually a really, really small effect. And that's unfortunate because a lot of the things that we'd like to see through that are scattering media, things like tissue, 
um, or fog, which are water droplets, those are actually really big scatterers relative to a wavelength, wavelength of light, which is the, the, the metric we need to think about in terms of what the actual phase function is for the scatterer. So a dipole scatterer that's very small will, will get very, very much suppressed by absorption, but a forward scatter like tissue, not very much at all. But, but it's interesting. OK, so let's go back to what are some interesting things we can do with, uh, so, with, with, with this solar steam idea. So the first thing we did, well, we know we can make hot energetic steam. <coughs> and so we built this really funny looking thing. It's ugly, but we really like this. So let me tell you what this application is. So, so this is an autoclave. So, what's, and so an autoclave is something that you can use to sterilize glassware if you're in a biochemistry lab or a molecular biology lab, whatever. So, so what this is, so if you, if you put hot energetic steam onto a surface, you can basically uh, sterilize it. And we know we can make hot energetic steam in, if we just put our nanoparticles in a volume and we put in a solar collector. <coughs> but this is designed for, this really simple prototype is designed for medical missions. So people who go on, on missions to, to developing countries, 90% <coughs> of the weight they take with them on a medical mission are the chemicals that they need to sterilize their equipment, whether it's medical or dental equipment, so we can think of dental instruments, for example, <coughs> it's, it's, a very, it's very much a limiting factor in terms of how many patients you can treat is how much chemi chemicals that you have to bring with you because they're not otherwise available. And so this is basically a portable, standalone type of unit that would allow anyone to basically sterilize, uh, st uh, sterilize chemicals. And so another aspect of this, so sometimes this is, this is another queasy topic, but, <coughs> but we'll get through it, <coughs> is that if we can sterilize dental instruments, we can also sterilize human waste. And that's a huge, huge problem. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is really focused on this as, as, as an, a, an issue that's just extraordinary in the developing world. And it's completely unessential. So these numbers really tell us an amazing story that people, so many people on our planet do not have a good way to dispose of their waste. And the sad thing is that this means that um, that, that, that water-borne illnesses, which kill one, more than 1.5 million children every year, are prevalent. And so they've been very interested in are there simple ways in which we can, uh, we can look at sterilization of, of human waste. So there's a company that was based out of MIT called Sanergy. And so they have a, a business, a franchise model in Nairobi, Kenya, which has no civil infrastructure in terms of civil engineering. <coughs> the people, uh, people own and they, and, and they um, charge people to use their very fresh and wonderful latrines. So this is something, my goodness, we take advantage, we, we, we completely take, take advantage of the fact that we don't have to worry about things like this, but these are actually uh, a very attractive business model. <coughs> and then this company, Sanergy, that, which, which s sells these as, 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 as franchise units, they then have a, uh, they, they go and collect the waste and then they, they purify the waste. These two people are working in a distribution center that purifies the waste. And the idea is if you can purify it, you can use it as fertilizer and fertilizer is really expensive. And so, um, so they're very interested in this. So we built for them a very simple uh, <coughs> solar steam unit. This is not the precise one that we sent to them, but this is this model that we built before that. <coughs> Uh, with the basic, uh, basic idea um, that, that this would basically sit in one of their intermediate distribution centers and the solar steam is generated by this unit actually uh, can be used to then to, to, to batch wise uh, treat, uh, treat, treat human waste. So um, they're now uh, operating this and seeing how this works. The reason this is important is if you don't use this and you have to go back onto the electrical grid and it costs a lot of money to do what we can basically do for no cost with this. So that's actually what their interest. So making steam is fun, but making whiskey is more fun, right? Am I right? Or vodka? Okay. So just as I showed you we can, that we can vaporize a pure liquid, we can try to vaporize a mixture of liquids and we can see what happens. So uh, it turns out this is also one of these really big energy problems, okay? And this is a hidden energy problem. So I, I, live in, I live in a part of the world where there's a lot, a huge, huge chemical industry, of course, related to, 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 to hydro petroleum and so on. But there's a huge chemical, uh, 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 chemical industry in, in uh, Texas. And uh, the one, uh, the, the major huge energy sink for all the chemicals that get made is distillation. So you can make chemicals, but as you know, anyone's run chemical reactions, you make several different products and you have to separate them. So separation is what costs an extraordinary amount of money. Uh, and um, 
So if you look at just sort of the numbers, for, so these are all US numbers, but you can see that the cost is, uh, is, is really ex absolutely extraordinary just for separation. No alternative technology exists. And if you just use the example of bioethanol, okay? So bioethanol is a good example because it's just like making whiskey, right? So and I'll tell, talk a little bit more about this, this or vodka. I'll, I'll say vodka for the purpose of my local audience here. So, uh, <clears throat> so basically, it's like you take a feedstock like sugar cane or corn, and you ferment it using yeast until the yeast dies, right? So you get to like the 9%, 10% level, right? And then you distill that, and then from that you get the, 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 the ethanol. <clears throat> and so that's exactly how bioethanol that you put in vehicles is made. And <clears throat> so if you look at this actual cost of making bioethanol, um, it, uh, uh, roughly on the order of 75% of, of, of the energy costs go into this one, uh, the, this, this one process, which is distillation. So the cost is very large, but in the States, we, we subsidize this because it's required to put in our, in, in our gas tanks. So, <clears throat> so let's go on back out to our outdoor laboratory and let's see what we can do. <clears throat> so we put na light absorbing nanoparticles in our little uh, distillation apparatus with a little condenser. And uh, we're going to see how much uh, a distillate we get off. And we, when we compare this to the same process without nanoparticles and heat, heated with a solar source, we found, we found right away this was very I interesting little qualitative uh, measurement that we get, seem to get a lot more distillate off much faster uh, than we did for a thermal uh, distillate. So it seemed like a more efficient process. But what was really neat was the fact that it really differed as a process relative to when we, when we just do conventional thermal uh, distillation of, of ethanol. So this is probably familiar to many of you from your high school chemistry books. So this is the distillation curve of ethanol. So um, if you go up to like 90%, uh, then you can't distill anymore. They don't separate. So this is uh, called an azeotrope, and this has caused lots of problems. So you can't make dry ethanol, right? You can't get all the water out. <clears throat> so then we, we, did, we, we did our experiment in, um, uh, in well, we, we, we did our experiment with, with, with solar, and then we did our experiment uh, dry in a laboratory with laser. We found that right away we get out much, much more uh, of a drier fraction, a much more ethanol-rich fraction of, um, of ethanol. In fact, the azeotrope seems to actually disappear. And I have to tell the story about this. So the person who, the, the, the brainchild of many of our distillation experiments is a, is a research scientist in my lab, and her name is Oara Newman, and she's from, um, she's from Israel, she's from Romania via Israel. And she was so excited about doing these experiments. And so it was a bright, sunny day. She woke up. Oh, it was a cloudless day. I'm going to do these, I'm going to do some of my distillation experiments. And so what did she do? She immediately, she ran to the, to, to, to the store and she rushed in and she went to the, where they sell beer. And she was looking and she was kind of talking to herself and she said, I've got to find the strongest beer I can possibly find. And so then someone came up to her and said, young lady, can I help you? She says, I'm looking for the absolutely strongest beer that you sell here. And he said, young lady, whatever your problems are, that is not the answer. <laughs> So, so what would happen if we actually make bioethanol? As I mentioned, in Brazil, they use sugar cane. In the US, they use corn. There's lo obviously lots of ethical questions about using things that humans can consume to, to, to put in your gas tank. So that's an that's a, a important conversation to have. <clears throat> but then you ferment to make beer, and then you can distill. You could use a solar distillation to then produce, uh, produce pure, ethanol, pure ethanol. But let's get greedy. Okay, Why should we actually use those feedstocks? People have been talking about this cellulosic ethanol for, uh, for like 20 years. Okay, could you use wood or could you use grass, right, just out in the field? You know, something that has very, very limited value. <clears throat> and then could you make ethanol out of it? Well, it's got sugar in there, but the sugar's trapped in the lignin. It's trapped in the stems. <clears throat> so we could also use solar steam. It's just like overcooking your vegetables. You know, if you really cook your vegetables way more than they should be, and then you drink the water, the water's sweet. Because all the sugar, the starch is broken down, and all the sugar is left in the is is left in the um, in, in in the the supernatant, right? And so 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 we should be able to basically combine these two processes into basically sort of three processes where we where where we steam our grass or our hay. Um, and then ferment it, and then distill it. And so like any good research group, we of course have a graduate student in our research group who makes beer. So he knew everything about how to do the right kind of fermentation. We basically just went out to the, went out to the, the grocery store and bought 
simple yeast. We didn't use bioengineered yeast, so we just used the simplest thing as possible. And so we, we actually we build all these steps. So the first step is to overcook our, our feedstock, our hay, and then to ferment it and then to uh, distill it, all, uh, all using sunlight from start to finish. So, <clears throat> so I'm not going to get into the, the details of this, but grass is not optimized like this is a, we're looking for glucose. There's lots of other things in grass. Um, <clears throat> if we compare it to sugarcane, sugarcane is optimized. It has a lot of glucose. So this is a lot of other stuff, but we can at least, we, we can, we, but it's there. Right? And so we can actually look at how we could ex extract it. We compare this to sugarcane, because if we can't do this process with sugarcane, we shouldn't even try doing this with grass. <coughs> so we, of course, can, can, can buy some sugarcane, and we go through the whole process, and we do the, all, all the, the steps, uh, fermentation and distillation, and we get a lot more uh, ethanol that for, for with sugarcane than with hay. That doesn't surprise us at all. But basically, both processes are shown start to finish absolutely off-grid. Right? You could do them in the middle of the wilderness, and you could go from grass to ethanol uh, very easily. <coughs> so another aspect where, where, where distillation is really important has to do with a pro problem that I'm sure mo most of you know about, and that is the fact that we, there's not enough wa drinkable water on the planet either for human population, and it's compounded by the fact that there's lots of nasty industries that make water, waste water, and don't really know what to do with it. They spend a lot of money trying to figure out what to do with it. And if you look at sort of the, the global equation about this, then <coughs> you realize that all this wonderful water out in the ocean, of course, can't be, can't, can't be accessed until you actually look through all of the different ways in which this gets used, and you find very, very little uh, water that's actually available. And the problem with this is, as I said in the, in, in the in case of the other process, that um, <laughs> excuse me, that, that there's a huge energy cost if we want to uh, use ocean water, for example, for drinking water. 50% of the cost of all desalination plants is the energy needed for operation. So as we're talking about making more fresh water for people, we actually are talking about I increasing our carbon footprint because we're using so much energy to actually make that water for, in order for people to drink. So something that is off-grid that would actually produce uh, fresh water is something that we'd be really interested in. So people who do water treatment, they've been looking at this for quite some time, and they have a um, Two processes, reverse osmosis, it doesn't work very well for salt water. You're very, very limited with reverse osmosis. <clears throat> the more saltier your water is, the harder, the, the more energy you have to put into the system. So it's really not good for, for, for desalination, it, although it's used. <clears throat> but there's this process called membrane distillation, where you have a porous membrane and you have two flows. So you, have, you start with, 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 with salt water. And you heat it. OK, so now all, right, all of a sudden, we're, there's a huge energy cost. And you make a delta T between the heated uh, input water and the actual distillate water. This delta T establishes a vapor pressure difference. And so when the water flows across the membrane, it actually converts to vapor through the membrane and recondenses on this other side of the membrane. And so this, the desalination works really very nicely. But the problem is this. The problem is you have to heat all of your input water. And so it's very energy intensive. And so we thought, well, why don't we convert this into a solar process, just like I showed you before. But now we're doing this on a membrane. So we put the, 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 the nan, uh, light absorbing nanoparticles. In this case, we use carbon black. <coughs> and, we, and we convert the, the membrane into a photothermal membrane, right? So we irradiate through a window onto the membrane. And then this is what this, this local heating here inside the membrane, I'm sorry about that, uh, induces at least it wasn't my mother-in-law, <coughs> induces, um, in, 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 induces a vaporization, and then it condenses here. And we can do this without any delta T. We don't have to heat the input water at all. We have, everything's at the same temperature. And so, um, and, and, and so we try this. So <coughs> we use carbon black. I'm just, it's, it, it, it matches the solar spectrum uh, well enough that it's, it works very well and is very, very cheap. can be incorporated into our membrane. And so we figure out how to take a membrane and make it an optically absorbing and, and uh, we're using, using all of the under, our understanding about uh, photon statistics and about uh, absorber scatterers, we optimize how much light gets absorbed in this region within this absorbing scattering coating here. And we use that as, as, as input for our, for our membrane to optimize the, the light delivery uh, in the region of the membrane where it's going to do the most work. <coughs> and, um, and then we have this wonderful uh, Italian postdoc 
who is able to basically take every single module of a COMSOL from Maxwell's equations using our Monte Carlo input to uh, solving also the fluid dynamics, thermal transport, and mass transfer in order to describe this very complicated process quite accurately. And then, of course, we build it. So we build the structure. So this is a map. This is just the way it looks. It has a tiny little window because it's a, just a simple experiment. It's not meant for, for, for prime time. We put the whole thing in a box for insulation, and we focus light onto the, uh, onto the window, and we see very, very nice solar. I'm not going to go into the, uh, any of the details here, <coughs> but I'll just show you. Once we actually have focused sunlight, we have a very, very nice agreement with experiment. We're actually able to produce uh, with basically no energy, uh, just a simple solar pump, and you can actually use foot pump if you wanted to, to drive the water through this process. And the thing that's interesting about this process is compared to membrane distillation that I showed you where you start with a delta T, where you start at the input is the highest efficiency and everything goes downhill from there because the delta T gets smaller and smaller. But when you light from, when you, when you put sunlight on it, you start with a delta T of zero, but r right away as the water flows, the delta T gets larger and larger. And so the, actually the process scales up with increasing size, where membrane distillation goes down with increasing size. So membrane distillation is a dead end. It'll never work. But, but, but this process actually looks, looks really quite, quite promising. Um, and while our experiments way over here, we hadn't yet really exploited the fact that for larger areas, that's something that is going to work really very nicely. <clears throat> so what we're making is something, it's like a solar panel, solar panels for electricity. This is a distillation panel. And if we go, go through the numbers, uh, we can actually, so, so, so a desalination panel with one, uh, one square meter, okay, <clears throat> can actually produce drinking water for, it, it's, three is a little higher estimate, but it's about two people per day. Their, their daily use of drinking water. Um, without any, uh, without any, fo any Im fuel input. No, um, you would just need a, a, just a solar pump, so no fossil fuels, basically. <clears throat> with, and with focusing, this actually would go up by about a factor of seven, so this number is maybe a little bit high, about 15 or so. <clears throat> so this is actually very exciting, if we think about it, that we, that we actually could think about building a, a, a very simple type of panel that would actually begin to process, uh, uh, process clean water in remote uh, locations or places where we don't have to plug into the grid and actually provide things for, for people. So plasmonics is a big field. And I haven't talked about a lot of other things, so I'm, which I certainly don't have the time to. But just want to mention that, pla that, that within the context of, 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 of plasmons and combining metallic nanoparticles, you can see some beautifully rich physics, like coherent phenomena. Um, for example, this is a phono resonance uh, that you can make with nanoparticle clusters. <coughs> for chemists, there's lots of wonderful opportunities for detecting molecules, either using different types of aptamers um, and their optical signature for using surface-enhanced Raman uh, spectroscopy down to the single molecule level. <coughs> you can actually, when, when a plasmon decays, it generates a hot electron. That hot electron can actually be used to drive new types of photodetectors. <coughs> I mentioned photothermal cancer therapy. There's, there's lots of other very interesting applications involving things like drug delivery that are all, of a lot of interest where plasmonics can play an important role. And as I just described to you, light harvesting for solar, for, for solar energy, something that we're very excited about for since for solar, for direct solar energy, not for photovoltaics. People are working hard on photovoltaics and making wonderful progress. But we're looking at this for something where that where where we're using light light energy much more efficiently than we ever could if we started with solar energy and then did the conventional uh, approach. So with that, I just wanted to, I, I want to mention. So we, we talked about plasmonic nanoparticles and uh, and and, and uh, light scattering collective light scattering, how we can use that for, uh, for heating, and how that's remarkably related to, uh, to cancer therapy, <coughs> and how we can also use the same effect for uh, new ways to, do, to, to, get, uh, uh, to, use, to use sunlight to make clean water for, for people, for folks. So I have a lot of wonderful uh, um, uh, collaborators, and this list is not updated. I apologize for that, but this picture is a pretty recent one. These are my, 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 my wonderful students. <laughs> who are from physics and chemistry and applied physics, and electrical engineering and bioengineering, and even these days civil engineering. I think we let a civil engineer in. <laughs> so we have uh, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, wonderful, great ideas that come out of these guys. And one I mentioned earlier, Aura, who is the champion of our solar steam effort. So she actually took our this is our solar steam 
uh, uh, one of our, our first generation solar steam apparatus, and she took it to Seattle to meet this guy. I don't know if you recognize that guy. Uh, he, as I mentioned him earlier, and uh, she was also, uh, she was really happy to meet him. She came up to me afterwards and she said, that guy, he came up to me and he asked such wonderful questions. Who was that guy? <laughs> so, so with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. That's a really good question. You don't exactly know what they are. This is one of our, in, in, in any of those contexts, you're sort of, you're flying blind, right? You can't put an accurate number of nanoparticles into a tumor. So that's why the, 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 the so part of this is, of course, operational or empirical, but that's also why the light uh, delivery strategy is done in a very comprehensive way so that you can um, access all parts of the tumor uniformly. as much energy as uh, conventional uh, methods does? That's a wonderful question. So this is why we started to use carbon black, because carbon black is something that is, um, that is, that is very inexpensive, has been mass produced for more than 100 years. So if you have ever used ink um, or asphalt, you know, uh, uh, that, that's the black, that's the black in newspaper, newsprint. So um, it's a, a, a pigment that's, uh, I think it's also the black in tattoos. Okay, so, um, so, so that, that, that's usually made by burning organic matter in a, in a furnace or an oven. It's actually made in many, many different countries. So because it's, 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 it's made with very, very inexpensive feedstock. So you're just burning some organic, like corn cobs, for example. Bur burn organic matter up to a certain temperature. So. Um, so, so you're, you're right to always think about that, but if you're going to use a nanoparticle solution, this is undoubtedly by far the cheapest way to do it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's sold by the ton. It's a commodity. It's also, it also has some very elegant physics associated with it, too, but I'm not going to go there right now. Okay. Next question, please. So in conjunction with the previous question, uh, I'd like to ask um, uh, how does uh, carbon black uh, differ from just simply coloring your water, making it appear darker. S say what you said. I did not. Uh, so how does carbon black? As I, I understand, uh, that solar vapor generation with uh, silver or gold particles involves uh, like some osmotic effects. Yeah. It absorb. It, it 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 involves being a strong absorber or absorber scatterer, so anything that falls into that same category. So, so one, part, maybe one thing you're asking there is, is carbon black plasmonic? We, so we, and, the, and the question is, we actually don't know whether or not that's a plasmon or not. We know it's a very strong absorber of light, and there's some interesting, very fundamental, interesting questions about the nature of, of, of carbon black as an optical absorber. It's actually, um, it, it, it's, it's very, very close. It's sort of a, in the same family as graphene, so it's very likely that there is this, that, that, that it is a, a plasmon, but that's not something that has been officially uh, confirmed at this point. So we can, so we can use uh, any absorbent particle, absorbent nanoparticle, to, for solar rapid generation. The que so, so the question is, so, so so you couldn't use something, so, so it would be much, much less efficient to use something like a quantum dot, for example, because you have one photon in, one photon out, right? You have making an excited state, and then you, you're cycling in one photon at a time. If you think about a plasmon, a plasmon is exciting. So, so if you have, have 10,000 electrons in a metal particle, then you're exciting 10,000 electrons. The, this cross-section of the particle goes as the number of electrons in the particle. So the cross-section is orders of magnitude larger than, 
say, a dye molecule or a quantum dot. And the example of that actually is the pregnancy test that I showed you earlier, that, that, that how much more vibrant and, and how, much, how much stronger a metal nanoparticle will interact with light than something like a molecule or a quantum dot. the stability of uh, your nanoparticles, especially for the animal experiments and for this because it's for clinics, I think it's very they're very, so they're, they're, they're extreme, extremely stable. They're, so, so the company had to do five years worth of research, really extensive research to study the, 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 the um, all, any uh, uh, biological effects in large animals and in many different contexts. And the result is the most boring paper you've ever read because there is no, they, they, they've actually, they, they, they actually dosed animals to 20 times, dosed animals to 20 times the human dose. And what they saw was a, a, a small discoloration of the liver that went away. You know, so there was very, um, so, so, so they actually just never saw um, any, 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 any problem with, with that. For the solar cells, it's possible to use only one cell for like uh, 20 years, something like this. So it's, if we buy for the, another country, it's uh, stable and uh, we don't need to change the, the well, uh, n from what we've seen, we so so we've done this in several different contexts. In the sort of the first distillation work that we did, we actually put the particles in the water, and then we put the water vessel at the at at, at, at the focus of a par parabola, right, a, a, a para par parabolic reflector. And there, and we would produce steam, but then we would we would lose our liquid, and so we used a foot pump to then put the liquid yeah, back yeah, in there. They stay; they don't get conveyed in the vapor. And we actually had them; we've had them there since the, the, about 2012, I think, was when we actually built that built that setup. So they've been there for a very long period of time, and we've actually had undergraduates working on them. So they did horrible things to that system where they had backflow of filthy water into that s system. So um, w what happens is over time, the nanoparticles will fall out of solution. But then as soon as you illuminate them, then they, 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 through convection, they get heated up again. Is it possible to use uh, nanoparticles only on specific tumors in one place, or it would work even in leukemia case? That's a wonderful question, and this has to do with a lot with how one how one develops a technology. Okay, in this case, the nanoparticles have no antibodies or no targeting molecule. Okay, and that means they're not a drug, and so the Food and Drug Administration, the, the, the governmental body that would approve this, looks at them as a, as a device that is not a drug. Special device is a nanoscale device, but it's not delivering a drug. And so that actually is a much more straightforward process for approval than if we just put an antibody on it. That would convert it legally into something that was, that, that was a chemical. But in principle, yes. I mean, in principle, that would be exactly how you, you know, there's a lot of interest. And in, we certainly have done, in the research lab, we've looked at how you can target certain, t certain cell lines uh, with different types of, uh, of, of antibodies or aptamers. Thank you. You get two. Question about uh, therapy. Uh, what happens with uh, uh, tumor when it decomposes, so the matter has to go somewhere. So does uh, it? Uh, uh, so these some, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, in a logical response or some toxicity maybe. No, so well, so so well, when cells are lysed, so we ha we're 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 we have cells dying in our body all the time, and so we have lots of mechanisms of lo lots of enzymes that then uh, will. Uh, you know, recognize we have we have cells right that are basically the 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 the, the garbage collectors and go through the bloodstream and they take any kind of fragment that they can detect and they and the, and, and and they internalize it. So um, we through phagocytosis, right? 
And so um, that's usually not, you know, that, that, that's, that mechanism is, 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 works for this as well. Um, so you're probably thinking about metastatic disease, whether you, you, so you re, you're, you're destroying this tumor and then will this then release cells that will then go off and form cancer elsewhere. That's a very interesting and important question. And it's probably, so in many ways it's probably unanswered, but people know a lot about the, the, the pathology of metastatic disease now. And they're also, so they're, they're beginning to believe that even at the very earliest stages of tumor formation, even before a tumor is, when it's much smaller than something that could actually be recognized by us, that, that also the, already the seeds to metastatic disease are moving into, are, are located in other organs of the body. And they just need some sort of a switch to turn on to, in order to, uh, to, to grow. So th th there's sort of an old conventional model that a tumor has to be very large and then it somehow, it really, at, at a mature state, it releases metastatic disease. And people no longer believe that that is the case. So metastatic disease is, of course, a really important problem. Uh, this does not directly address it, but things like targeting that were mentioned earlier, those are certainly processes that could address it. And then got by no, in fact, they're, so if they were, uh, so, so that, that's an interesting problem. Um, but because the particles are about 100 nanometers or so in diameter um, within this application, they are removed through the kidneys. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. They're moved through the liver, not the kidneys. So they have, there's no kidney toxicity associated with, um, with, with, with nanoparticles. They um, are, they, they, they're removed through the, it, through the process of the liver um, within sort of a, kind of a time scale of about six to eight weeks. So it's longer than sort of conventional drug, but they avoid the route that often, uh, happen, the, 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 that often causes toxicity, and that is uh, entrance into the, the kidneys and destroying of that tissue. I'm sorry? So now particles uh, dissolve practically into both uh, molecules. No, they actually don't decompose. So they're, they're taken up and they're, and they're released through the solid matter. So I don't have to say that. <laughs> Although I talked about that already in a different context. Um, but they, uh, so, so, so they leave the body intact. 